So hello everybody, welcome back to this new webinar session of here in the, of the Law Physics webinars. So this is the last webinar of the fourth season. So we have been already 39 webinars, that is, is a record for us. And before to start with the webinar itself, I just remind you that you can make, you can follow us in YouTube and, or Twitter or WordPress. You just have to follow the links that is gonna be in the description of this video. And also, uh, all the questions to the speaker, to Tian Tian, is going, uh, you have to make it via the YouTube chat of this. You're going to find this chat in, in the right part of the, of the video. So let's start then with the webinar itself. Uh, today's speaker is Tian Tian Yu. She's uh, a postdoc at CERN. And before she did uh, some postdoc in the CN Yang Institute for Theoretical Physics and in Stony Brook University. And also she had been a Fermilab uh, graduate graduate student fellow. So, Tian Tian, whenever you want to start, you are welcome okay. and welcome here. Great, yeah, well, thanks for the invitation. Let me share, share this. Okay, let's see, check the time. So I'll be talking about today about some work that I've been doing over the last few years with, um, primarily with Ruben Essig and Tomer Volansky on different ways to look for sub-GAB dark matter through direct detection. So as a kind of a way to start off to motivate, I'll talk a bit about the theory background. So I'm primarily focused on this mass range of KV to TV WIMP dark matter. And so in this mass range, there's a few ways that you can produce dark matter. The first one is maybe the most familiar one, and it's if dark matter is a thermal relic. The idea here is that uh, in very early times, the dark matter was in thermo equi thermodynamic equilibrium with the thermal bath. So you have this back and forth process between chi chi bar, which is the dark matter, to the standard model. And so as the, you know, the number density starts to cool, um, they, they cool together, the, the thermal bath and the dark matter until you get to a point where the dark matter does something called freezes out. And what this means is that the annihilation cross-section um, is the size such that the two dark matter particles cannot find each other. And so you freeze out the number density of dark matter. This, uh, this cross-section is kind of a nice theoretical target for a lot of dark matter models. And so the reason why this is maybe the most familiar model for thermal relics. In particular, there's this um, paradigm called the WIMP. It's so popular, and so WIMPs are for dark matter masses between GV up to the, the unitarity bound of 340 TV. The reason why the WIMP was so popular is we have something that's called the WIMP miracle, which is, um, you can decide for yourself whether you think it's a miracle or not. But the point here is that when you have a dark matter that has weak scale masses and weak scale couplings, you automatically get the correct relic abundance. So this was, um, this is very nice. Uh, another way of producing dark matter is through asymmetric um, means. And so th the basic idea here is that, so we know in the universe we have a baryon asymmetry because we, we exist. There's more matter than antimatter. And so you can ask, oh, what if the the way to produce dark matter is related to this baryon and asymmetry. And so this is the mechanism in asymmetric dark matter. So the exact mass prediction depends on um, the way that this asymmetry is created, but roughly we, this would predict masses between kV and a few, a few GV. Uh, and the final way that I'll talk about, that I'll mention later, is something called Friesen. And the way that Friesen works is in some sense, exactly opposite of how freeze out works. And the idea here is you have dark matter that's very, very weakly coupled to the thermal bath and has a very low number density and it's slowly, slowly starts to get produced um, throughout of equilibrium scatterings. And so in this sense, the, the number density slowly increases as you go, go forward in time. So here are three different ways of producing dark matter in this, in this mass range. And so how do, we, how do we look for these dark matter candidates? Well, in the very low mass N on the KEV scale, we have astrophysical uh, probes. So for example, the Lyman alpha force measurements are the ones that set this KEV lower bound 
for uh, thermal dark matter. In this WIMP, uh, WIMP regime, in this weak scale regime, we have collider searches. So collider is like the LHC where created to look for new weak scale physics. And so in that sense, they can also look for WIMP dark matter. Uh, these WIMPs can also be searched for indirect detection, which has been a very, uh, very active field for the last couple of decades. Um, which, and the current direct detection experiments are uh, optimized for looking for, for WIMPs. But you'll notice that there's this gap uh, between this astrophysics detection methods and these direct detection methods that currently are un unprobed. There haven't been a lot of uh, work, experimental work, to look for dark matter in this mass range. So how do, we, how do we solve this? Because I've shown that there's ways of producing dark matter. These are dark matter models that live in this mass range that are well motivated. So we should try to, to look here. And so in this talk, I want to claim that we can target this region with direct detection. So very quickly, what is direct detection? Um, the basic idea with dark matter direct detection is you have some target material, which is this uh, blue this blue region, that sits deep under underground usually to to shield it from cosmic to rays, etc. Shield it from cosmic rays, etc. Somebody is somebody is not muted anymore. Not muted anymore. Okay, you can continue, it just was a bug, okay. let's say. <laughs> All right, so we have this, uh, this target material that's somewhere deep underground, and the idea is where our galaxy is surrounded by a dark matter halo. So there's dark matter zipping through the Earth at all, all times. And if you assume that this dark matter can have very small interactions with, the, with us, then you can say, you can look for the scattering of dark matter off of one of the atoms in this target material. And so you can either scatter off the nucleus or the electron, and you look for some recoil of the atom. And so like I was saying, there's been a lot of progress in the last couple of decades in direct detection, and they've been primarily focused on dark matter nuclear scatterings, because this is a, a nice way to look for WIMP, WIMP dark matter. So what I'm showing here is sort of the current state of affairs for dark matter direct detection where on the x-axis I'm showing the dark matter mass in GV, so it goes from roughly 1 GV to 10 TV. And on the y-axis is the cross-section for WIMP nucleon scattering. The blue region is, um, I think right now, the cur current strongest bound. I think maybe there is one that's slightly stronger that got updated recently. But this is a bound from LUX, which is a liquid xenon detector. And what this blue region means is that LUX, uh, because they have not seen any anomalous events, any extra events, that they rule out dark matter nucleon cross-sections in this blue region and above. Uh, there's future projections from experiments like LZ, which is another liquid xenon detector that's um, going to come online in the next few years. And it would have a reach of this black dashed line. So what this means is it would be sensitive to cross-sections of um, where that black dashed line reaches. And then super CDMS, uh, Snow Lab, of this green line, and here they can go down to slightly lower masses, so they can go down to 400 MeV. The other thing that I'm showing in this plot is this salmon, this red salmon colored region, which I call the neutrino background. And so this is the, um, the cross sections where you would not be able to differentiate between a dark matter scattering and a neutrino scattering. And so in some sense, you can think of this as being the lowest you can go in dark matter direct detection. For, to, if you want to discover dark matter. Otherwise, it's, it's difficult to differentiate between the two types of events. So you can see that in this plot, we're really covering a lot of this, um, this parameter space. And so far, we, we haven't seen very much. So in this, like, this uh, gap region that I was showing earlier, this was at lower masses, where right? it was between MEV and GV. So you can ask the question, how do we get down to these masses? I want to go sub-GV. Uh, and the other thing that you'll notice with LUX and LZ and even the super CDS snow, snow Lab is that they have a lower mass limit. In which, for example, LUX and LZ can only get down to a few GeV, and super CDMS can only go down to 400 MeV. So, for example, if you have a dark matter that's 100 MeV, then it would be invisible in all of these detectors. So, in principle, you could have dark matter 
out there, but you would just not be able to see it with these experiments. So the question you can ask is how, how can we access this 100 MeV dark matter through direct detection? Um, so the answer, the answer to why these, this LUX and the LZ curve and also the super CDMS curves stop at a certain point is, is kinematics. So when you have dark matter nuclear scattering, the amount of recoil energy that you have available to detect goes roughly like the momentum transfer squared over twice the nuclear nucleus mass. And this goes roughly like 50 kV times the mass of the dark matter squared times uh, over the, the nucleus mass. So if I take, for example, um, and this, this energy that you have is available to be detected in a few ways. You can look for phonons, photons, or electrons. So of course, the more energy that you have available, the, the more signal you, you get. So if I take a typical uh, target like silicon, which is what super CDMS uses, uh, the nucleus mass is 28 GeV and the dark matter, and we take our typical WIMP dark matter of 100 GeV, then we have 100 kV of energy available to, to detect. Now I go to my 100 MeV uh, dark matter, and the amount of recoil energy we have available now is 0.1 EV. So we've gone from 100 kV to 0.1 EV of energy. So the point here is that 0.1 EV is well, well below the thresholds of any of these direct detection experiments. So would never have, you would never be sensitive to recoil energies this small. So how do we get around this? Um, so that was with dark matter nuclear scattering. But you can make the observation that inside an atom, you also have electrons. So instead of looking at dark matter scattering off of the nucleus, you can look at dark matter scattering off of the electron. And in this case, the signal that you look for is the scattered electron or a few ionized electrons. If that electron is energetic enough, it'll ionize additional electrons. And in this case, the recoil energy goes roughly like half an EV times the dark matter mass in MeV. So I'll go back to my, the same example of dark matter scattering off of silicon, but this time it's scattering off of the electron. And I take my 100 MeV dark matter. And now I have 50 EV of recoil energy available to detect. And this is starting to get in the realm of possibilities of, these, of some of these experimental uh, programs. All right, so um, um, the next part of my talk is going to be going to be a little bit more technical, but I'll talk about how, how you calculate the rate of dark matter electron scattering. So there's roughly uh, three ingredients that go into this calculation. So the very first line, I'm showing you the, the scattering rate or the scattering cross-section as a function of the energy. And so this thing that is in the blue box, this eta of u min, is the, where the astrophysics sits. So eta v min is known as the inverse mean speed. And this tells you how the dark matter velocity distribution is in our galaxy. And usually we take this distribution to be Maxwell-Boltzmann, because we assume that the halo is virialized. And eta v min is this distribution over v integrated from a minimum velocity to, uh, to the escape speed of, of your dark matter in the halo. What the minimum velocity is, it's the minimum velocity that your dark matter needs to have to, um, to scatter off of the electron and give you a certain amount of, so this depends on the momentum of the dark matter. The second ingredient is um, these things in the red boxes, and this is where the particle physics lies. So this is where you parameterize how your dark matter and the electron talk to each other. And so in, a, in an effort to make this as model independent as possible, uh, we parameterize it in terms of an object we call sigma e bar, which is a reference cross section for dark matter electron scattering, where we fix the momentum transfer to be alpha me. And then you can pull out all of the, the momentum dependence of your scattering and put it into this FDM of Q. And in this way, we can, present, we can present our results in terms of uh, the momentum dependence of the scattering. So for example, if my dark matter electron scattering is mediated by a, a heavy mediator, then this cross-section is momentum independent and FDM equals one. On the other hand, if it's mediated by an ultralight particle, then the cross-section is going to go like one over Q squared. So FDM is one over Q squared. The last ingredient is uh, this form factor, this little f, which is a material dependent quantity. And what little f tells you is the wave, it's the wave function overlap between the initial and final electron states. 
So the way you can think about this is it tells you the probability of an electron going from some initial state i to some final state i prime. So with these three ingredients, we can wrap them up all together. Uh, then you can integrate over your energy threshold, multiply it by the local dark matter density, divide it by the dark matter mass, and multiply it by the number of target nuclei per unit mass. And now you have the rate for dark matter electron scattering. So this gives you the number of events you would expect to see per unit mass per unit time. So the first example um, I'll talk about is, is xenon, which is a noble liquid. And in this case, this form factor um, is given by this expression I have on the bottom of the slide. So it's a bit complicated, but the point here is that we have um, these, these Rs, are electronic wave functions calculated with Hartree-Fock methods for atoms. So the Hartree-Fock method tells you that you can think of each atom as being this isolated atom, and you can get these wave functions out of it. So for a hydrogen atom, this method is exact. We've done, we've done this in class before. Um, and for more complicated atoms, you have to do some approximations, but it's, it's fairly accurate. So with, with this form factor, I can now calculate the number of events I would expect in a xenon detector. So on the right-hand side, I have a, a schematic of, of xenon. So xenon has atomic number 54. And the electron configuration for xenon, I, I give down on the, the bottom right-hand screen. On the left plot, I'm showing you a spectrum of the number of events you would expect to see as a function of the number of electrons that you, you get out of the process for a dark matter mass of 1 GV and 1,000 kilogram years of exposure. And here in particular, I'm showing you the, uh, the spectrum for the FDM equal to 1, so the heavy mediator case. And so the different colored lines tell you the contributions from the different shells of the electrons. So on the bottom right, I have the electron configuration. And so the different colors correspond to the electrons that live within those shells and uh, how they, they show up in this, in this spectrum. So you can see that at really low, low number of electrons, it's the outer more shells that contribute, the 5P5S five, the five shells. And then as you go deeper and deeper into or as you get higher and higher energy, the number of electrons corresponds to the energy, you start to probe the inner shells. And so the 4D turns on and the 4P turns on and 4S turns on. Um, this black line is the total rate that you, the total number of events you would expect to see. And this gray shaded band is this uncertainty from the secondary ionization. So what this means is you scatter off of one electron. If you have enough energy, if that electron has enough energy, it'll ionize secondary electrons, but this process is not known exactly. So this uncertainty is what's in the, the gray band. Okay, so now that I have a, a rate a calculation for the dark matter electron scattering cross-section, or the number of events I would expect to see, I can compare with, uh, with, the t with data. So I was saying before we have these bounds from LUX and in the future LZ which are xenon detectors. And some other examples of xenon detectors are xenon-10, xenon-100, xenon-1 ton. So these detectors are called two-phase TPC, um, time projection chamber experiments. And they consist of a bulk of liquid xenon, which is uh, this LXE, with a layer of gaseous xenon on top. And then on both ends, they're end capped with uh, photomultiplier tubes. So for a WIMP search, uh, what they do is they look for a direct uh, scintillation signal. So this is this S1, where the WIMP scatters off of the nucleus and it produces a scintillation. The backgrounds in, for WIMP searches would only produce an S2, which is um, these secondary electrons that, yeah, that produce photoelectrons that are then uh, detected. And by looking at the ratio between S1 and S2, they discriminate uh, between WIMP signals versus background. However, in the dark matter electron scattering case, you need an S2 only signal. What this means is you don't have this direct uh, scintillation signal from the WIMP scattering off the nucleus because it's not scattering off the nucleus, it's scattering off of the electron. And that electron gets drifted up and you detect that electron itself through its S2 signal. And so here, what the, the measurement is, is photoelectrons. So each electron will produce a certain amount of photoelectrons. And so for example, for xenon 10, um, they, they've done an S2-only analysis. They've released the data for that, which you can see on the, 
it's PRL on the right-hand side. And so what I've taken here on the left-hand side is I take the Xenon 10 S2 only data, which is the orange, these orange bars, as a, it's the number of S that they see as a function of photoelectrons. And so for Xenon 10, one electron produces 27 photoelectrons. So the inset shows you the binning in terms of number of electrons. On top of this, I've overlaid the spectrum for two different candidate dark matter events. So in blue is if the dark matter is 10 MeV. And you can see that it peaks at low, at low, um, low electrons. So it mostly populates the one electron bin and populates a little bit in the two electron bin. The red uh, spectrum is for a 1 GeV dark matter. And you can see here it gives a more like even distribution across electrons. So it populates both the one electron bin all the way to the seven electron bin. And so what you can do here now is um, to set a limit on the cross section. So you assume that all of the events that you see are, are dark matter. And you say, what is the cross section that I need to explain these events that I see through dark matter? And so by asking this question, then you can set limits on um, the dark matter electron cross section, which I'm showing in, on this slide. So on the left-hand side are the limits for a heavy mediator, FDM equal to one, and the right-hand side are the limits for a light mediator, this FDM equals one over Q squared. The black line is the total, the total limit that you get, whereas the different colored bands are the contributions from the individual bins. So before, in this, in this plot, you can see in the inset I have these different bins that are uh, that are demarcated for one electron, two electron, three electron, etc. And so these bands roughly correspond to one electron threshold, two electron, three electron, etc. So you can see that for the on the left hand side at low masses, it's the one electron bin that dominates. So this we saw in the in the spectrum that the 10 MeV one really populates the low, the low bins. And as you get up to higher masses, it's the, the higher bins that, that set the limit. On the right-hand side, for the ultralight mediator, we see that the, it's the, the one electron bin that sets the limit no matter what. And the reason for this is because you have this one over Q squared suppression. And so, or you can think of it as being, you get an enhancement when you're at very low momentum. But when you're at low momentum, it means that you have to, uh, you don't, you don't have very much recoil energy available to detect. So you, pop, you mostly populate this one electron bin. We can do the same exercise with Xenon 100. So Xenon 100 also had a S2 only analysis that they released uh, last year with this, uh, this spectrum on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, it's the, the same thing <coughs> as the previous slide. But now for Xenon 100, and Xenon 100, um, one electron pr produces 20 photoelectrons. So we can do the same exercise here, and the xenon 100 limits are the ones that you see in red, are these red lines. So on the left-hand side, uh, so the other point, sorry, I forgot to mention here is the xenon 100 data started at four electrons. So they don't, they didn't show any of the data below four electrons, so they have a threshold of four electrons. And so you can see this in, um, the effects of that threshold in these two plots. So on the left-hand side, you see it because xenon 100, it's not able to go down to as low of a mass as xenon 10. While it's on the right-hand side, because you require at least four electrons, uh, xenon 100, and I was saying for the light mediator case, the limit is set by the one electron bin. That xenon 100 is not competitive with xenon 10 in this case. Okay, so, so I've showed you these limits um, without very much context. And I started off the talk with a discussion about different dark matter models. So we can now kind of put these limits in, in terms of a very specific model. And the model I have in mind is a model of a hidden, hidden photon. The, the way that the dark matter interacts with the electron is through a hidden photon. So on the left hand side, I have this little diagram of a dark matter scattering off of an electron. So the dark matter talks to what I call a hidden photon, which I denote by A prime. This hidden photon kinetically mixes with the regular photon, which is A, through a mixing epsilon, which is where this red X is. And the regular photon talks to electrons. And so I've shown here, it's many equations, but it's the expression for sigma E bar and FDM in this very specific model. And so 
the thing to note here is on the bottom with this FDM, you can see that when you have a heavy mediator, this goes roughly like one, whereas if you have a light mediator, so the hidden photon is much smaller than the momentum scales, it goes like one over Q squared. Okay, so in terms of this dark photon model, uh, here are where the xenon bounds sit. So in the gray I'm showing on both, both sides are limits on dark photon models from other experiments or other searches. So on the left-hand side, the lower uh, masses are constrained by beam dump experiments, which look for dark photons directly. And on the right-hand side, uh, the limits are set by current direct detection. So these are the nuclear recoil experiments and collider. So the collider bound is primarily set by Babar, which is an E plus E minus uh, collider that looks directly for dark photons. You can see that the xenon 10, xenon 100 bounds, um, it's hard to see in this plot, but around, uh, let's see, 50, I think four, 60 MeV, there's a little gap where the xenon bounds are the, in principle the strongest bounds that you have. On the right hand side, we have at low masses bounds from supernova cooling constraints, which constrain very light masses. And on the heavy mass side, you have the current direct detection constraints. But because um, in this case, you have this one over Q squared suppression, you don't have bounds from colliders or these beam dump experiments. So there's this middle, middle ground between a few MeV to a few tens of GeV where there are, are no constraints at all. And the only constraints that you can set now are from these dark matter electron scattering direct detection experiments. So this model on the right-hand side is really where the strength of this technique comes in. In both of these plots, I'm also showing these uh, kind of yellow, gold, orange lines. On the left-hand side, the yellow line is um, this freeze-out cross-section if you have a scalar dark matter. So earlier I was saying one way to produce dark matter is through thermal freeze-out. And the cross-sections that you would need to get the observed relic abundance are, are at this, this yellow line. Um, if you have an asymmetric model, then the cross-sections that you would need are this orange line. So in this case, I assume that my dark matter is a fermion. And you need to be above above this line. So these are nice uh, theoretical target regions for, for the heavy meteor case. On the right-hand side, um, I'm showing the line for a freeze-in model. So remember, this was where your dark matter is produced through freeze-in. And the cross-sections that you would need to produce the observed relic abundance are in this gold, this gold line. So these are, for this, particular model um, you know, motivated regions that you want to be able to reach with these experiments because they're theoretically very interesting. So theoretically interesting targets. Um, okay, so the other, so when I did these xenon bounds, the thing that I assumed was that all of, all of the observed events were signal. And so, okay, with this assumption, then you can start asking some more questions, like, oh, how can I start to differentiate the signal? Can I start to look for interesting features in the signal if it's all dark matter? And one feature that you can look for is something called annual modulation. And so the basic idea with annual modulation is that it said that our galaxy is surrounded by a dark matter halo, or it's enveloped in a dark matter halo, where the dark matter is realized. The sun is going around the, the galaxy in some specific trajectory. And through the motion of the sun, um, you create an effective dark matter wind in the opposite direction of the sun. And our Earth is going around the sun. Um, and so depending on whether the Earth is going the same direction or the opposite direction of the sun, you either have a dark matter headwind or a tailwind. And the consequence of this is when you're going the same direction, for example, in June, uh, you would expect a slight increase in the rate of dark matter events because the flux is higher. Whereas in December, you would expect a small decrease in the rate. And so as a result, you would expect a, a annual modulation in your rate of dark matter events. So what, what are the sizes of these modulations? So in xenon, for this dark matter electron scattering, uh, I'm showing here it's the fraction fractional modulation as a function of the number of electrons that you see. So this F mod, I define as the rate in June minus the rate in December divided by the mean. And we can see that uh, we have modulation rates of a few percent up to a few tens of percent. So these are actually fairly sizable 
um, modulation signals. And so the light blue lines are for a 100 MeV dark matter, and the black lines are for a 1 GeV dark matter. The dashed is for a light mediator, and the solid is for a heavy mediator. So the other thing you'll notice here is, for, especially for the, the dashed lines, as a whole, the modulation is higher than for the solid lines. And this is because you have this 1 over Q squared dependence, and so you, you're sensitive to events that have low momentum transfer, which means that they need to have high velocities. So you're sitting on the tails of the velocity distribution. So you're very sensitive to the velocity distribution of your dark matter. Likewise, as you increase the number of electrons that you see, you, you need to be at higher, higher velocities because you have a larger amount of energy that, you, that uh, is needed. So in this way also, this is why you see this increase in modulation as you go up in number of electrons. OK, so now that we have this uh, fractional modulation, we can do an annual modulation analysis. And the way that you do this is um, we quote a significance, which is roughly the modulation fraction times the number of signal events you see, divided by the square root of signal plus background. And if we set this value to 1.645, we can set a limit at 90% confidence level. So we do this. Um, so here I'm assuming that I have 1,000 kilogram years of exposure. And I'm showing two, two different colored lines. So the blue line is for xenon 10, and red is for xenon 100. What I mean by xenon 10 and xenon 100 is I assume that I see the same rate that the xenon 10 or xenon 100 experiments see now, and just scale it up to 1,000 kilogram years. So this is my, my background, my B in the previous expression. And with, with this value, I can set these kinds of limits. So you can see with 1,000 kilogram years, you can start to probe a lot of these theoretically interesting regions. So the point is, because you'll have a lot of events, um, it's worthwhile to look at annual modulation in these cases. OK, so I've pointed out, I keep pointing out these um, these theoretically interesting target regions. And so you can ask, OK, how, how can we reach these? For xenon, I think, OK, if we have 1,000 kilogram years, you can start to reach them. But with the xenon experiments, also, they they curve up at a few MeV. So if you want to go below a few MeV, you have to come up with a new way. So what's limiting the reach of these, these xenon experiments? Uh, one limiting factor is the electron energy. So for example, the, in a noble gas, the minimum amount of energy you need to ionize one electron is uh, roughly 10 EV. So for xenon, it's 12, 12 EV is the ionization energy. So this sets the lower the limit um, on the lower mass reach. So if you can decrease this energy requirement, you can start to reach much lower masses. And so in this case, one alternative you can look at is semiconductors, which have band gaps of 1 EV. And the band gap is roughly equivalent to the, the ionization energy. The other thing that limits you um, is the number density. So xenon was a, a liquid, and it has uh, this, this density that I have on the screen. Whereas a semiconductor like silicon is a solid, so it's much more dense. And so you have many more targets per volume um, to scatter off of. So this would allow you to go lower in cross-section reach. Okay. So the point now here now is, okay, we should start looking at other materials, and one nice material to look at is semiconductors. All right, so semiconductor targets is uh, also, was also a very active, or is still a very active field of research. And so I, I have a few references down here on the bottom. And so here's a picture of the energy band structure of silicon that we, we've calculated, matches well with the uh, experiment. And the orange region is the field valence band. So these are the energy bands that contain electrons in them. So there's four, there's four valence bands, there's four valence electrons. And then we have the band gap. And then we have um, these empty conduction bands. So this is roughly what a semiconductor looks like. And so some rough numbers for, or some numbers for the band gap energies are for silicon, it's 1.1 EV. For a semiconductor like germanium, it's 0.67 EV. So even, even less than an EV. Then we also have, I also list um, gallium arsenide, which is another, another semiconductor, has a band gap of one and a half EV. And some common scintillators 
like sodium iodide and cesium iodide have slightly larger band gaps, but these are all smaller than the ionization energy needed for xenon. And so in these semiconductor targets, what we have is, so we have our electron that lives in the valence band. We have our dark matter that comes in and scatters off of the electron and promotes it up to the conduction bands and it leaves behind a hole. So once the electron is in the conduction band, you have a couple of options. One is you can apply an electric field, you have some voltage and you extract the electron itself. And this is what I'll call an ionization signal. The other thing that can happen if you're in a scintillating material is the electron and the hole that it left behind recom recombine and this and produces a photon. And this is what I'll call a scintillation signal. Okay, so we have these two, two different paths depending on the material that you're scattering. And so for a semiconductor, which is a solid, uh, the form factor, it turns out, is much more complicated to calculate than in the xenon case. And the reason for this is because the electrons in a solid are part of a complicated many-body system. And this means is they feel the effects of all their, all their neighbors. So we can't have this uh, isolated atom picture that we, this Hartree-Fock method is not, is not accurate for situations like this. Instead, we have to um, use some more complicated numerical techniques. And so what we did was we went down the hall, and this was when I was still at Stonebrook, and we found additional condensed matter colleagues and asked them. So we have this problem that we're trying to calculate uh, electrons in a solid, can you help us? And they said, ah, oh, in fact, this is what people who do solid state do. And there's this code called quantum espresso, which is a open source code that calculates exactly this. It calculates the electronic structure um, in any material that you want, want using something called density functional theory. So what I did with a, a graduate student, well, one of these condensed matter graduate students, was we wrote a module, which we call QE Dark, which you can find at this website, which takes quantum espresso and calculates these form factors that you need for dark matter electron scattering. And so, okay, with this, then we get, uh, we, we have some results. So I'll show the results for, for silicon in particular. So here is the spectrum, the expected rate uh, that you would see for silicon. So I've normalized the rate to one in the first spin. And I'm showing the rate for two different dark matter masses. So in black, I have uh, one GV, and in blue is the 10 MeV. And so you can see that for the blue line, the lighter dark matter mass, the rate follows pretty rapidly as you increase the number of electrons or you increase the energy. Likewise, the, the different types of lines are for the different form factors, with the most shallow line being the solid one, which is the FDM equal to one case, and the steepest line being the dotted line, which is the one over Q squared case. So here you also see that as you start to increase the, the number of electrons you require, uh, you, you're really penalized by this one over Q squared thing. Okay, so I have this spectrum, and then so when I start talking about different thresholds for uh, experiments, what do I mean? So I mean is, for example, if I have a 10 electron threshold, it means you have access to the events living in these blue, in this blue region. So you can see all events that have 10 electrons or, or more. If I have uh, five electrons, then you can go, you access more elect, more more of this uh, spectrum, and you can see more events. And then single electron means you can see all the all the scattering events that were created. Okay, so how does this look? So here is the same dark photon uh, parameter space plot, which is the dark matter electron cross section as a function of dark matter mass with the xenon bounds. And now I'm showing on top of it are the, the reaches for a silicon detector with one kilogram year of exposure. And so the blue line is the reach that you would have if you have a 10 electron threshold. Red is if you have a five electron threshold and green is if you have a one electron threshold. So you really see that as you decrease your threshold, you get huge gains in your, in your reach, your orders of magnitude gains in reach. So currently, super CDMS um, threshold is at 10 electrons. This is the lowest that, that they can go. So they can start to access some, some interesting parameter space, but it's still, still not reaching these uh, theoretically interesting regions. Instead, so the question is, OK, can we, can we go lower? Can we go down to single electron even? Because if you could get down to single electron, you cover 
basically all of the uh, interest in parameter space? The answer to that, uh, to that question is yes. And in fact, through this work, this motivated uh, some of our experimental colleagues to, to look at this a bit further. And as a result, we now have a collaboration called Sensei. So Sensei stands for Sub-Electron Noise Skipper CCD Experimental Instrument. CCD somehow didn't make it into the acronym, but it's the most important part of the, the name. So Sensei is a silicon CCD detector using something called skipper technology, which allows it to have a single to a few electron sensitivity. So he, here's a list of the people. And it's, we're a combination of theorists and experimentalists. It will be at Fermilab. Um, so so Javi, Javier Tiffenberg was the, the main person who was really pushing for this. And he was able to fabricate one gram of the silicon skipper CCD. And the next step is, so the sensei will be at Fermilab. So he, on the left is a picture of Fermilab. There's Wilson Hall. And the, the next step will be to put it inside the Minos Hall, which is about 100 meters underground uh, next to the NUMI building. And we're going to put this one gram there and start start to take data. So this is in the next few months that this will happen. Uh, and so here's a, this is a very cool plot that Javier showed us. So this is when you take this one gram of skipper CCD and you just count the number of charges that you see in each pixel. And you can see that the, um, so here the number of entries is a function of the charge that you see. And what the really notable thing about this plot is that you can really differentiate between the different peaks. What this means is you can count single electrons, right? So you can really see the difference between having no, no, uh, no charge, one electron, two electrons, et cetera. Uh, unfortunately, the dark current, which is these thermal fluctuations, limit your threshold to two electrons. But what oh, we've demonstrated here is that you, you can get down to two electrons. This is not a theoretical prediction or a possibility. We've demonstrated that you can get to two electron thresholds. So with uh, this two electron threshold in Sensei, and the goal is to get to 100 grams, uh, here are what, what you would expect to see. So on the left-hand side, and this green dashed line is if you had sent, say, with this two electron threshold and you let it run for one month, you would be able to beat the xenon balance and probe a lot of this interesting uh, parameter space. On the right hand side, it's even more impressive because you turn sensing on for one minute and you can beat the xenon 100 bounds. And if you let it go for one day, you could have the strongest balance for this ultralight mediator case. And then if we can go down to the full, uh, a full year, then you start to probe almost all of this uh, parameter space that is theoretically well motivated. So this is Sensei, and it's uh, something that should be happening within the next year, year or two. We're applying for, for funding for this right now. So this is something to keep an eye, eye out for. Uh, OK, let's see how long on time. OK, so in the last part, I'll, I'll talk about kind of a bonus, some work that we're still working on right now. And so with these form factors and in, in these solid state crystals, so here is the expression for the form factor with the psi i star. Psi i prime, sorry, is the electron wave function for the outgoing electron, and psi i is the in incoming electron. Uh, the point here is that there's directional dependence, right? We have the little vector arrows over our momentum, uh, momentum vectors. And so what this tells you is that you potentially could have some very powerful signal discrimination with these solid state crystals. And so one, uh, one example is, here's a picture of gallium arsenide on the left-hand side. This is a one, one what, molecule of gallium arsenide with the, the different electrons sitting on it. And these, uh, these colorful plots I'm showing are the form factors in the, Z, the ZY plane for, for gallium arsenide for different values of QX. So you can start to see, so the red spots are where you have a high amount of overlap between the initial and final state electrons, whereas the, the blue is where, where there's no, no overlap. 
the point here is because the crystal has a fixed orientation, that as you rotate it, you would expect a difference in the rate depending on which direction you're hitting hitting the crystal. So here's a picture of gallium arsenide. It turns out gallium arsenide, even though it looks not very symmetric in this uh, picture on the left, it's a bit too too symmetric for for our case. Instead, uh, we're looking at something called gallium nitride instead, which has this um, like uh, what's called a crystal wurtzite structure, where you have a hexagon in one plane, and then rectangles in another plane with little pyramids stuck stuck to them on the sides. And so on, on the right-hand side, I'm showing these form factor plots and slices of y and z versus x and y. And you really see that there's a difference in, in, the, in the plots, in the form factors, depending which plane you're, you're looking in. So, what, so how can you how can we exploit this um, this directionality of these crystals? So the idea that we have here is to use daily um, daily modulation to exploit this directionality. So here is a picture of the Earth, which is rotating, and we have the dark matter wind, which are these black arrows. And so, for example, at six a.m., our detector is in this top red square, and the wind is hitting the detector on the short the short side. Whereas at 6 p.m., where it's rotated down to, uh, to the left-hand side of the, the figure, the dark matter wind is hitting the detector from the long, on the long end, long side. And so for gallium nitride, in this last slide that I showed, you could see that there really is a difference in the form factors depending on which plane you're, you're hitting it in. So the modulations that you would expect for this, so for gallium arsenide, it's, it's sub percent. So gallium arsenide is the blue, these blue curves. This is the modulation, is a function of time of day. Whereas for the gallium nitride, which is the green lines, um, we could get modulations of a few, few percent in principle. So this is for a 100 MeV dark matter mass. Of course, this is still preliminary work. We're, we're still checking, checking the code to make sure it's doing what we expect, but. It's kind of a nice, uh, nice bonus of these solid state detectors that you could do. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, so I hope in this talk that I've shown you that dark matter electron scattering allows us to reach sub GeV dark matter masses. And currently, um, the only constraints for this dark matter electron scattering come from the xenon 10 and xenon 100 S2 only analysis. But in the future, in the very new future, in fact, semiconductor targets like Sensei will be able to push down these limits uh, by orders of magnitude. Because you're sensitive to the velocity tail, because the, the dark matter electron scattering process is really sensitive to the velocity of the dark matter, you have a much larger modulation rate than you do in nuclear scattering cases. And when you have a semiconductor target like Sensei, or not sensei, but if you have a semiconductor target like with gallium nitride, because of the rigid structure of the crystal, um, in principle, you could have some directional detection, which would be an, another very nice handle for to discriminate your, between your dark matter signal and your background. So that is it. So thank you very much, Tintin, for this very complete talk about the Sujivi matter. And I guess we can start with the round of questions. So first of all, I want to remind to the people that uh, you can make all the questions that you want to Tientien via the YouTube chat. So now we can have some time to kind of write questions. Try to be precise and short because of the time that we have for the, for the webinar. And maybe we can start already with people from here from the session. Please, the one that want to make a question, please unmute you. It's uh, yourself and ask it. Okay, I have a question. Okay. So first, uh, uh, thanks to the webinar. So my question is about uh, Xenon 10 and Xenon 100. So I was mm -hmm. wondering why typical uh, Xenon 10 gives stronger bounds than Xenon 100? So the, the main reason for that is because of the threshold. So Xenon 10 had data down to single, they had single electron, single two, three, four electron data. Whereas xenon 100 required at least four electrons. 
Oh, okay. So. And so by requiring at least four electrons, it, the minimum amount of, it's basically you're saying the energy threshold is much higher. And so that limits you in the, the both the mass and the, the cross section limit. Okay. So if, because I think in principle xenon 100 has they have single electron data. I think is what I've been told, but they they didn't make it public yet. But if they did have it, it would be probably slightly stronger than the xenon 10 bounds. I think it's it's difficult for them to to clean up the analyses that they haven't publicized it yet. Okay. And I have another question. It's about the neutrino background. So okay. at the very beginning, you show this neutrino background uh, starting from, I don't know, like maybe one GV or something like this. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, how, how does it behave when you go to the sub-GV uh, region? So it's, it's similar. Uh, this is actually something that I'm working on with a student right now. It's also preliminary, so I didn't, I didn't show it. Turns out, so for one, one kilogram year, you won't reach the, it, it's material dependent same, of course. But for one kilogram year, you don't reach the neutrino background. But as you start increasing your exposure at some point, even like a hundred kilogram years, you would start to reach the neutrino background at the, the MEV masses, like the low, the low end of the plots I was showing. It has a similar shape to the, the nuclear scattering neutrino background. But yeah, this is a good question because it's like, okay, you can keep pushing down the limit lower and lower, but then, that, yeah, exactly. At some point you hit the neutrino background and you become a neutrino detector and not a dark matter detector. <laughs> but, in, but in these cases, this is where it's useful to have like the annual modulation or the daily modulation signals because that could help you discriminate between the dark matter and the neutrinos. So it's not completely hopeless in those cases. Okay, I see. Thanks. So somebody has more questions because I mean well, for the moment I also have a couple of questions. Uh, the first of one is uh, I mean, when when you were showing these plots like uh, theoretical uh, scenarios that are very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. How it behaved the case of vector dark matter I mean, in, in the sense instead of scalar you have a vector. Ah, uh, this I I didn't. Yeah, I didn't look at. I don't know if somebody's already worked out the freeze out cross sections needed for for those. Yeah, I remember that for example for, for direct detection, like with not in the case of electron, usually these they were this model were more constrained for for instance for LHC, I mean missing energy. Uh, you're talking about like spin spin dependent spin dependent cross sections. Yeah. Right? I don't know with the spin independent and the or it behaved exactly like a scalar, I don't know. Yeah, this is something we we haven't looked at. It would be this is like so we have a lot of things that we would like to, like to do, and one of the things is to look at more models. So we just have these benchmark models, mm -hmm. and so for the heavy meteor case, for example, we look at a very specific ratio. We assume the mediator is three times the dark matter mass, but it's also interesting to look at different combinations. So this is something that we yeah. would like. To <laughs> yeah, and, and another question is the I mean about regarding sensei. Is this because you put in one of plot that you your lines your expected sensitivity is going to be for three hundred grams? What one hundred grams? Like yeah. Oh, one hundred grams. Yeah. So my question was: this type of uh, detector is also scalable, or, or you build one and upgrades are kind of? I mean, you can yeah, add more. Yeah, I think it could CCD, be. It, you, say, cool. Yeah, you could add yeah. you could add more CCDs. And the really nice thing about the skipper technology is there's only one one place that you you read out so the detector itself can be much bigger so this one gram versus 100 grams it still only has one readout noid node and it's this readout that was in, in the past what limited your sensitivity your threshold because there's noise that's involved in reading out your signal mm -hmm. and to avoid the noise you usually have a much higher threshold so if you only have one readout noid you can decrease so yes it is it is scalable i think it's not 100 grams, I think, was feasible. So for just to give you some numbers, for the 100 grams, like in our proposals, this would be you know, like $1.2 million for mm -hmm. 100 grams of the silicon CCD. So if you, so had, more money, yeah, if you had more money, then you could build some. But technically, it's, it's cheaper than uh, Xenon. Yeah, it's actually, it's, pretty, it's, it's 
I mean, I think it's pretty cheap. I don't really have a sense of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it's like. <laughs> No, of course, I mean, maybe if someone of Xenon can tell us how much it costs the, <laughs> the experience. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, I have these questions also. I don't know if there are more questions from the people here in this Hangout session, because then we can pass to the question from the, from the people I that are following. Ah, there is a question here. Because so when you show the description plots, you, you went till, like, no, 3 GV or something like this. So you can, mm -hmm. in principle, also go to higher masses, right? Okay, I yes. know that you're not interesting. I mean, the most interesting part is the the sub GV ballpark, mm -hmm. but in principle, you can go to to GV ish as well, right? Yeah, you could go to ten GV. So it, at some point, it's just it goes like one over m. So you can just extend those lines much higher. But once you get above, uh, I think a few GV, then the nuclear scattering ones are so much stronger that the dark matter electron scattering becomes very weak in comparison. So you could do it at those at those masses, but it's not going to give you the strongest bounds. Okay, thanks. But in principle, you can, I mean, this region, you can test models that are uh, leptophilic cases. Yeah, so the, yeah, yeah, I guess that's the other point. If you have a leptophobic model, then OK. <laughs> You have yeah, to do yeah, what I guess like Chris Covaris and Joseph Prather were doing with the Bramstrahlen. You need a different <laughs> a different technique. Yeah. So uh, let's let's pass. I don't know if okay. If there's somebody in here in the session who wants to make a question, you can ask it. And for the moment, we're gonna pass with the question from the from the people following us in YouTube. Uh, for the first questions, but I already I guess. Uh, Nicolas already did was uh, Joel Jones was asking about the this neutral floor in this case, but I guess you already said about no. Yeah. Yeah, and this is something. So, hopefully, in the next few months, we we can have a paper with a more quantitative number for that. Yeah. Now there is also there is a question. Uh, Miguel Angel is saying to you, Red Talk, and he's asking about the. I mean, he's. I'm gonna I'm gonna read the kind of the context of the question. So it's like it's like uh, an S2 only analysis is quite interesting. Challenge uh, set reconstruction is much worse without S1. You only have S2 with, and generally the R reconstruction gets worse too as the S2 gets smaller. So hence, you really want a special background model. You need a good treatment of the reconstruction and synthesis and a believable spectrum of the low energy wall surface and maybe cut out events. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a great, mm -hmm. a really great point. So with these S2 analyses, we don't assume, like we assume that all the events were a signal. And so this is a, cha a challenge with these dark matter electron scatterings is, yeah, the backgrounds are not very well, well known. Uh, partly because I think it was not the region of interest for these experiments in the past. So, I mean, more effort was done for these WIMP, WIMP searches. But I think now, with because dark matter electron scattering is gaining more interest, um, people are starting to look at these um, the backgrounds in this mass range or in this energy range some more. But it's it's like it's something that requires more, a lot more careful, careful work. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, the, the, the question at the end was like, how much you can trust on this S, S2 only, but you are saying. So I think, um, so we've talked a lot with Peter Sorensen, who is on Lux, and he's somebody who's very interested in these S2 only analyses. And in fact, I think the main, the main background that you have with these single, these S2 only searches is the fact that your electron can get stuck in the interface. So he, he claims that he thinks the main background for single electrons is after the scattering, the electron gets stuck in the liquid gas interface and then gets released at a later time. So this mimics a dark matter signal, but has nothing to do with, with the dark matter. And he, he has some ideas of how to eliminate the signal. So he had a paper out maybe last month where he had proposed some ideas and he's trying to propose a small, a small mini, mini xenon experiment to, to test this hypothesis and to do these S2-only analyses. Mm -hmm. So I guess, ah, yeah, there is another question uh, from Andres Perez. 
He's asking, uh, let me see, uh, the calculation you have done are for scalar dark matter only, right? Do you expect to have a to have weaker constraint from spin dependence event? Uh, so possibly we haven't we haven't done yeah, we haven't looked at the spin dependent. It's definitely worth worth looking at. So I'm trying to think of what would change. Yeah, because I guess in the nuclear scattering case, the spin dependent limits are much weaker than the spin independent. Yeah. So. Oh. Yeah, no, this is a, that's a good question. We haven't looked, we haven't looked into that. Yeah, also it's going to depend on the mediator that you put between how we interact with our matter with your electrons. Yeah, so for right now, we, we're assuming that the, we just categorize the interactions by the momentum dependence, and there's no talk about the spin dependence or anything. So these are all things you can add on onto it. Yeah, to the to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, now that all the, the, the talk that you were saying now with this question, I have another question that is about uh, which other background do you expect to interfere with this kind of signal? Do you expect kind of, uh, I mean, or in the case of uh, Sensei, how you have to shield Sensei to avoid that, for instance, uh, other type of radioactive background or whatever? Putting, a, putting it underground shields you from, from most of the backgrounds. In fact, the Sensei, the the primary background are the, the dark currents and the readout noise. Mm -hmm. So the dark currents is the thermal thermal fluctuations that where an electron just thermally pops up to the conduction band, and the readout noise is the, the noise that you get from reading the signal. And so the with the sensei, they what they do is they're able to effectively eliminate the readout noise. And the dark currents limit you to two electrons, but outside of that, it's effectively a background-free experiment. Okay. So there are no the so there's no there's no really like neutron yeah there's no the neutrons or anything. So. Oh, okay. It's That's really cool. it's really impressive. I think I didn't appreciate this until recently that it's really a background, effectively a background-free experiment. <laughs> that is, this is hard to achieve in any experiment, dark yeah, matter experiment. Exactly. I mean, like wow, it's really it's very really impressive. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, okay, ah, another question from, yeah, I mean, we were just discussing that Miguel Angel was asking if doesn't Sensei have any intrinsic background, but, yeah, but we, was, we were just talking about that, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, if there are no more questions from the people in the live chat, we thank all the people that made questions in the live chat, of course, and I don't know if there are more questions here for the, for the present here in the session of Hangout. So if not, I guess we can close this uh, law physics uh, webinar that we, we just had. First of all, I want to acknowledge Tien Tien for this very good webinar that she gave. And also to remind the people that don't forget to enter to our YouTube channel, to subscribe, to follow what we our activities. We are gonna try to complement with more topics to try to make this uh, law physics uh, webinar as much interesting as possible for all the public that is following us, for all PhD and postdoc students on any any part of the world, because you can access it in, in YouTube. So uh, see you on the next time and and goodbye. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you everybody. <laughs>